All right, talking about rings is what we were talking about. Rings. And we were talking about the oil scraper, which is an optional ring on a lot. Well, how do I say optional? It's, it's infrequently seen, but commonly seen on radials. Do you want to do this? You're doing a better job than I am. It's infrequently seen, but often seen in radials. Wow, that was very well said. All right. Um, it's not an option for you to put it on or not put it on. If it needs one, if it's got one, you have to put it on. <clears throat> so it seems to be optional for the people who designed the engine. So which way does it face? It depends. Depends is exactly right. So whatever the manufacturer says, that's the way it goes. So it would not be uncommon to take out a piston that's got a scraper ring down, because they all go down here at the bottom. They don't line up up here, so down here at the bottom. It would not be uncommon to pull it out, turn it upside down, and the word top is this way. Oh, that dummy put it in upside down. No, dummy probably put it in the right way, follow the directions. So, But all the other ones, you would see the word top and the part number going this way, or sometimes a little punch mark because it, the ink goes away. All right, so we got that. Let me see, oil scraper. Some scrape it in, some scrape it out. Uh, okay, measurements. Let me see, measuring, which you guys have already done. I guess now you're like holding your breath. Did we do it right? And it keeps defaulting to like, why is it doing that? That is so weird. That's gonna drive me nuts tonight. Okay, uh, what if I did this and did that? Yeah, we got fixed it. Uh, okay, measurements. So there's two measurements you have to take, which are inside and outside. Inside and outside. Side gap of rings. Side, side, side clearance and, and gap clearance, right? So we have ring and gap. Ring and gap. Uh, that is. I wish I'd brought a ring in. I have rings. Yeah. Well, let's see. Nope. I'll either get cut or break it. All right, so the ring, so we have, we're going to take the ring, and as you hopefully did, you put it in the cylinder, you're going to use a piston, so it sets nice and square inside of the cylinder. And where do you put that ring when you measure the end gap? Four inches down, two inches from the top of the cylinder. You need to pay close attention to where the manufacturer wants you to measure them. And the reason why is because you have cylinders with choke in them. We haven't really talked a lot about choke yet, but you know what choke is. It gets tighter down at, at the, the barrel end. I'm sorry, at the head end. And so that's pre-planned into the measurements. That's why you have to have a certain amount of gap up higher. So some manufacturers are going to want it up higher. Some are going to want it down lower. So I don't believe that Lycoming wanted you to go four inches down. I think it was only... Yeah, something like that. It wasn't much. Yeah, it's not much. So, But if it's straight to that point, then it wouldn't have mattered. But just make sure you do it right. So end gap. Uh, let's see. Yeah, how do we measure that? With a feeler gauge. Yes. M -E -A -S -E -R. Measured with feeler gauge. I had this cool tool, and I've been trying to find one so you guys would have it too. But it, it was just wedge-shaped, right? And then on the face of it, had all the markings on it and the numbers. So you just drop it in the, oh. drop it in the gap, and then Maybe read it, read wherever it was, and pull it back out. <coughs> Similar, yeah. It was kind of cool, but otherwise you can measure it. Feel the gauge, and then we have the side clearance. Oh, let's back up. What happens if your ring end gap is too big? Not going to seal it. And what do you do? Blow by. Too much blow by. What do you do? Got to get a different ring. What if it's a brand new ring and it doesn't work? Build up blow by. Yeah, solder the end. Yeah. Little little high temp RTV on the end. So you just got to replace the ring until you get. What if it never? All the rings you try are still too big. Oversize. Yeah, then you can go oversize. So you can buy a plus size ring. Do they so make rings that are just sort of like. Like cut to fit type things, like, you know, like are gr grossly oversized? Kind of. So, Lycoming does standard 1020. Continental has a P5 bore. So you have a standard bore, then a plus 5 bore, then like a 15 and a, a 20, something like that. Um, but the weird part about their P5 bores is you don't change the piston. It's the same piston. 
but they call it a P5 bore and you get bigger rings. And so there's no markings, no head markings, nothing. It's just, so in a sense, what you're doing is you're just getting different rings. This way I can see it. And so if you had a standard cylinder and the ring gap was too big, you can go P5. Okay, so now you get a set of rings. What happens if the gap is too close? File it. File you file it or grind it. So um, they make uh, little tools I'll show you tomorrow um, that you can, like a, it's got an abrasive wheel on it, little abrasive wheel, and you just pinch it against that abrasive wheel and you crank the little abrasive wheel, and then you have to break the edges. And breaking the edges is whenever you do some sort of work on something and grind it, um, well, you guys know, it's like when you used a, a shear on aluminum, you had to file the edges, right? Well, it's called breaking the edges um, in, in engines, so uh, file the edges. So if you don't have enough end gap, you got to grind it. So I guess everybody here must have had enough end gap. <laughs> yeah, what happens if you don't have enough? And you file it down. No, and, and you don't care. You're like, eh, you know, it's close. It it's, could be too it would, abrasive on the cylinder. It will break itself. It gets down and it touches at the end of it. Gets down into the choke. It's going to get too tight. Not enough space. It'll make space. It breaks. So that's really bad. All right, so side clearance. You guys measured your side clearance. I kind of gave you the trick on how to, with the half wedge or wedged rings to put it in. The uh, oil control rings are square, so they're, they're real easy. You should have figured that. Um, what if we have too much side clearance? That ring's gonna flop around in there. Yeah, so we have too much. What's the problem? Floppy too flop. thin. What's that? Ring's too thin. Oh, you bought a brand new ring. Now what? Your what piston's all worn out. Yeah. Your piston. Bad piston. Too much is bad piston. What if it's too tight? Too good piston. Yeah, your piston's too good. It does happen sometimes where, especially, well, you're not supposed to do this. I can tell this one's had it done. But some shops, it used to not be a big deal, but it is now. Um, uh, so you're going to get a bunch of carbon in your piston, right? So how do you get the carbon out? Well, yeah, back in the olden days, they would put it in just some sort of chemical and then rinse it off. And the carbon would be gone. You're like, look at that. Uh, but now we use a, a media, blast media, which the preferred would be what? Walnut. Walnut or plastic. It blasts the carbon out real well. And then some shops would then give it a nice glass bead, you know, finish it off a glass. Mm -hmm. Well, I know now that's really a bad idea because the glass impregnates itself and you get glass in the engine and that's abrasive. But glass also does what to aluminum? It peens it over. So it's going to take all of these little lands right here and, and the space in between, it's going to peen the edge over just a little bit. So you got to go in there and you got to break Tool the edge. File. But now you're, now you've just, you're, you're, Solving a problem you shouldn't have created. So I would say walnut, plastic, and then you're done. Call that the government. Call that the government, good enough. Solving a problem that made. Yeah. So uh, too much. Uh, not enough is usually also a piston problem. Um, but let's say you had a new piston and new rings, and for some reason it just wasn't enough. There wasn't enough what? Enough clearance, side clearance. Too little. Too little. Then what do you do? File it down. I don't know. Yeah, that's the hard part. You know, some people would say, well, you could take a flat plate. A flat plate is a, like uh, that, the table that I sit at in the lab, that's a granite flat plate. We have metal ones. You can put some um, sandpaper, like 180, and you can do a little figure eight with the ring and kind of file it down a little bit. Problem with that is, where's your data to do that? Yeah, so well, if you don't if have data. Chrome to chrome plated, then it probably takes up. Well, I guess the chrome's just on the edge. Yeah, so you just got to be careful with what you do. You know, a lot of people out there, we're mechanics, right? So by nature, if you are a mechanic, and that is your nature, we fix things. And it gets really difficult when you're like, I know how to fix that. If this was on my car, it would be no problem. But uh, it's on an airplane, so don't, don't get caught doing that. 48313. If you can find data, then do it. You know, yeah. Is it common, like you buy new rings and you would have to um, custom put the end gap on it? Totally, com it totally common, all the time. Okay. All the time, freaking hated doing it. If you buy a piston from somebody and it's just too tight, then can you call them up and say, you sold me a piston that's, yeah. and they'll give you a different one or something like that? It's not like a... Generally, it depends on how you buy it. You know, you buy it through, like, aircraft spruce. They didn't make it. It's like, hey, we just grabbed a box off a shelf and sent it to you. 
back when I was doing it, you know, I worked with um, ECI. I mean, they would just be like, hang on, let me put, you know, Joe on the phone. He, he made the piston. They're like, hey, what's up, man? You know, it's like, hey, this rings are too tight. Oh, what's the part number on that? Oh, yeah, which one are you using? Okay, well, this which you know, so, you know, or, or uh, AV all, they had close relationships with uh, manufacturers. I don't know, things are different now, but so, uh, so too little. Don't do it. Uh, probably still a bad piston problem, bad ring problem. All right. Um, so let me see. Oh, installation. All right. So you're going to put your rings back on the piston, and you're going to put the piston now into the cylinder. Well, we have um, gaps on all the rings. So let's just say we have a three ring. Oh, yeah, I can use my cool little tool. Do the thing. Do the thing. Okay. So we've got a piston. And we've got the rings on here. And uh, so we got three gaps, right? So gap there, a gap there, and a gap there. Well, where do we want to put the gaps? They're in the lane. 120 degrees away from each other. So there, I got them all lined up, right? So I want to line them up? No. Nope. No. What do I want to do? One third like a blade, right? Like a big piece size. So I could put one gap here, one gap here, one gap here? Yeah. Sure. So they said a piece sign. That's not a peace sign. That's Try it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What? What if you put one here, one here, and one here? Now they're 180 out. But then two of them line up. No. Yeah, Is that not? The first, if, you, if, you put, so. if you put top one gap, second one gap, third one gap. So this air would have to come through, go 180 out, then go through, then go 180. I don't have the answer. I, I think both of these are perfectly fine because the rings are going to rotate anyway. So, but I take it and I think it through just a little bit more than that. What's this going to do? Nah, shouldn't have done that. Just wanted to erase some of it. It's like I don't know. I don't know what you just did, dude. I don't. I'll I'll work with you, but come on. It's like you wanted to draw on all. I got it. All right. Uh, so there's. Oh, so take it a step further. I don't care if you go 180 out or um, third, third, and third. What's the math on that? 60, 60, 60. Or 120, 120, Nobody likes to show off. All right. So. <laughs> All right. Take it. At least think something through. Um, or this next part. Consider the fact that you are building your engine in a vertical, but it doesn't live in a vertical life. It lives horizontally. All right. So you've got a piston and you're putting it out this way, but it doesn't live this way. It lives this way. That was kind of weird because this is the same as this, but uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So. So it's going to fall with the gap up? Yeah. So you're, you're doing it like... Oh, well, this is the wrong cylinder for you guys because this goes on the bottom. But anyway, it's going to live like that, right? These are on the bottom on this one. So think about where you want to actually have your gaps end up. Like for me, I want the oil control up here. Because you're going to use a lot of oil in your cylinder. So why not put the gap up at the top for the oil control ring? Because there's not going to be much oil on the top of the cylinder. It's going to be down near the bottom. So let's put the oil gap up on the top. So I start with that, that logic. And then from there, I'll either do uh, compression, see the oil will be there, oops, compression will be here, or here, do compression there and there, or do the oil on top, one here and one there. So I think, you know, just talking it out loud, I think my, this would make the most, the oil control goes here, and then the compression, compression, and then nothing is down here where all the oil is gonna pull up. The bottom line is, I don't believe there's really a wrong thing to do as long as you don't line them up. And in my opinion, the reason why lining them up would be the worst thing to do is because now you've got a section, whatever that gap is, where nothing is touching, right? And if you have three things going through back and forth that aren't touching, what could you do? You could create a line right there where now... Low by hand, it could score the cylinder. Yeah, and then the, then the rings won't start rotating because rings rotate. So whatever you do, they're just going to rotate around. So um, let's see. So I would say, let's see, rings should be installed so the gaps are not aligned. I mean, that's just, we'll go with that. 
things should be installed. So gaps are not aligned. So if they're aligned, yeah, I think that's the problem. You're going to get blow by. You could get a bad compression reading. Um, rings do rotate. Rings do rotate. Um, about once or one revolution. Let's say about one revolution per five to seven minutes. Totally off topic, but I just discovered something on my airplane that I had not noticed. I have a print, I have a, a readout that tells me my economy in miles per, miles per gallon. That is not something that I want to ever see again. <laughs> on climb out, I get 5.7 miles per gallon. <laughs> But then I, I can't remember, I, I leveled off. I'm like, oh, freeze that. And, and I made it come up. So, because it rotates through a bunch of stuff. And I just looked over and said, econ. Five miles. I'm like, wow, I never noticed that. And then, um, so then I leveled off. And then well, I want to say it was like 15 point something when I leaned it way out. So that wasn't too bad, but. Okay, so rings. I guess that's all I can say about rings. Well, you are going how fast, too? 100 and. 15 knots, 145 miles an hour. So, yeah. um, what else can we say about rings? When, when sh this is kind of a funny thing because I don't know if there's really this hard rule about rings. So, when do you replace rings? Well, obviously, on an overhaul, you would do it. Uh, if you remove the rings from the piston, I wouldn't put old rings back on. But at what point should you? always change rings you know let's say you had a problem with the valves and so you're gonna say but the rings are fine so you send a cylinder out just to have a valve changed or you have to take it off for some reason you know and so you pop it out of the cylinder should you put run it put new rings on well, what was the aftermath <clears throat> what's that what was the aftermath of it the aftermath yeah like was it just dumping oil into it or anything else oh Thank okay you. so what he's saying do you have any other symptoms yeah no let's say you had fine compression was just leaking out of the the valve well then it's not fine compression was it um, you're burning a lot of oil, you know, so it's just judgment calls you have to make. I, I, you know, it's hard to give you advice on that. I had the equipment to do it. So in my shop is like, well, why wouldn't you? Does, does, if you have, if you don't bore or hone a cylinder, you just leave it how it is and you pull the piston out, is there harm in changing the rings? Okay. That's a good one. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I wouldn't do that. You would keep the same. <coughs> I would keep, if I honed it. I would definitely put in new rings. If I didn't hone it, I would definitely not put in new rings. So re-ringing and honing go hand in hand. If you hone it, new rings. So hone equals new rings. New rings, you better hone it. <clears throat> Follow? And I don't know if I'll talk about it now, just in case I forget that some of the time. Let's talk about break-in. So, you know, break-in's a big deal. You hear a lot about break-in. You know, I remember one time I test drove as a Saturn. And the guy, you know, let me show you how to get, you know, the salesman just like, you know, it's got like one mile on it, just takes it out, just floors it and flogs this poor little car. I'm like, don't you have like a break-in? That's the great thing about these cars. They have no break-in. Okay. <clears throat> you, yes, it does. Yeah, it has breaking, <clears throat> but what what is really what is break in when you? That's something we all talk about with with engines. You got to break it in. The more expensive cars. Uh, somebody bought a Corvette. I was reading an article, and they're like, "Yeah, they you know couldn't wait until the break in period so they could really see what this car would do." I'm like, "Ah, oh, somebody cares about their car." So what does break in mean? Everything wears into itself. Much. Yeah, it wears into itself. What do we want to break in? Rings. Mostly the rings. Well, so, but then if the rings are rotating, then what's the, what do you, how is it breaking in? It's like, you, you imagine like a pad and a rotor on a brake. Yeah. Or something like that. There probably is like lines that, spe that are very Specifically do, yeah. So they're not twisting all around, but the rings twisting around. So what the hell? All right. So what he's talking about 
is if you have a brake pad, which is perfectly straight, that's the pad, and you have a rotor, and may that rotor microscopically kind of looks like this. Yeah, well, if it looks like that for real, you need to change it. When this brake pad touches against this rotor, well, it's only going to touch here, 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 and here. That's not a lot of stopping power, right? You want the whole thing to be touching. So it takes a little while before this brake pad starts to look like this. The opposite of that is what I'm trying to draw, so never mind. So it's the opposite. You're doing a great job. Yeah, I'm sure I am. Um, so when the, when the two are mating, so you have 100%, all right? So in, um, when we're breaking in cylinders, it's kind of like this, except we have a ring that has got a square surface and a cylinder barrel that looks a lot like this. Because when we talk about honing a cylinder barrel, we're talking, and I know I do talk about, yeah, I get into this a little bit. I'll just remember this when I get there. Um, we have a cylinder barrel that has been honed. And you saw I took the hone, I took that bottle brush hone, and went around it, and it's got these balls that put these scratches in, and the scratches are supposed to be at a 45 degree cross hatch. So if you look in there, the whole cylinder looks like that. It's all this scratching, all right? So what that scratching does is it allows oil to fill these little areas right here. And so ideally, we are kind of have a ring riding on a very thin film of oil, not metal on metal contact, because that's not going to last very long. But we do have these high spots that need to be broken down. So breaking in is actually where you knock off these high spots, and but you just just the rough edges, the very pointy of the pointies. So you want to get rid of the pointy parts of that cross hatching, but you still want a pattern in there. You do not want a smooth surface at all. Smooth surface will not work because oil then gets by the rings. Or you're going to burn a lot of oil. So you want this, this ridge where you can hold the oil. So breaking in is knocking those off. Well, why then do we, you know, won't it just happen on its own? It doesn't. Um, you have to be careful, especially in aircraft engines, what you're doing with this. So you take an engine out, and, you're, and, and this is the funny thing, an aircraft engine. Oh, it's a brand new engine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, go to a long runway, and I'm only going to have just, just enough power to take off. I'm just going to baby this thing as much as I can for the first 100 hours. You know, minimal power. I won't even go full power, you know, unless, you know. You have to, but if I have to take off, I'm pulling the power right back. You baby it, you're going to screw up because what happens is we need pressure because rings aren't square actually, right? They're like keystone. So we want that pressure to come in here and force that ring out. Otherwise, the ring just slides and nothing is actually wearing. And you, you got to wear it out. So you need the pressure to come in, force the rings against the walls. We need high power. So you actually want a high power setting to break something in. Got to get that pressure. Uh, number two, heat is really, really bad. So you got to have the high pressure without the heat. This becomes a little bit of a balancing act because if you heat up the cylinder too much and heat this oil up, what does the oil do? Burn. Burn. It cokes. Mm. So it creates a varnish on the cylinders. Well, now you've got this varnish that you can't get rid of that fills in all of the gaps. So we get a nice varnish that goes right across everything. So now what do we end up with? Smooth oil. Smooth, oil. Smooth surface never breaks in. You're going to burn oil for the rest of the, rest of the life of the cylinder until you finally get fed up with it and take them off and have it honed. So, so you have to do that. So typical break-in, well, if you break it in on a stand, there's a, a, we can go over that, I think, at some point. But there's a procedure where you just bring it up in slow increments, so many minutes at a warm-up, and then you bring it up to mid-power, and then eventually run it at wide open, 100% power for about an hour and a half or something. Um, if you're flying the airplane, you want to stay at lower altitudes. Why lower altitudes? More air to cool. Uh, there's air everywhere. You have more, more, pressure. You have more pressure without the... More manifold pressure. So lower altitude is more manifold pressure. And for like the first hour, you're supposed to run about 70, you know, take off at full power because that's safe. And then run at about 75% power for 
I forget, something like an hour or something. Then you land, you check everything, then you go back up, and you're like 65%, alternating between 65 and 75%. And it's this little dance thing in there, but always watching those temps. <clears throat> so, and the temps will be higher before it breaks in because you're going to get blow by past the rings. You don't have a good seating. So temps tend to run kind of higher on everything. Um, yeah, so that's, that's break in. Question. Yes. So um, is it fair to say the rings wear more or the cylinder walls wear more in terms of metal loss? Wow, that's a really good question. And I wouldn't know because I've never measured a, a, a ring in that dimension. You know, I never, there, those factors aren't given. So if you have a, a ring, whatever. <laughs> You know, the ring, the ring looks like this. Of course, there's a gap in it, but um, so we have the gap right there. And I've never measured it in this distance right here, you know. So I don't know, and that's not given. I've only just measured the bores. And so I tend to think it's the cylinder because I notice thousands missing off the cylinder, but I've never, never measured the ring to see how many thousands are missing there. So that's a really good question. I don't know. Yeah, we just throw the rings away, put in new ones, measure the bore. So, all right, so that's rings. Let me see. Um, now we'll talk about piston pins. Piston pins. Well, obviously, the piston pin connects. Connects what? Conrad to piston. Connects conrod to piston. Uh, they are made of what? Soft steel, soft iron. High strength steel. They are hard. Did um, you say they were soft before? No, they're hard. Oh. Conrods are soft. Oh, 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 the pins. Oh, I thought you were the Conrad. Pins, pins, pins. pins. Um, they are not solid. Why not solid? Weight reduction? Why not, yeah. Um, some of these light combing pins, though, are, I mean, they're pretty thick. That's a typical light combing right there. Um, not solid. Um, weight reduction is the only thing I can think of. So we could do uh, three classifications. You also probably don't need all that strength for it, too. No. Um, and this would be how they're held in the pistons. We have stationary. So not free to move, so they're not free to move and locked. To piston boss. So that would mean that you put it in the piston and it is locked in here. It does not slide back and forth. Nothing falls out of it, and it is locked to the piston. But it'll float on the connecting rod for obvious reasons, because two have to turn. Um, then we would have, and I'm not aware of any aircraft engines that do that. Then we'd have semi-floating. So that would be locked to the connecting rod. But floats on the piston and I'm not aware of any aircraft engines that do that and then we have the full floating oh I take that back I think there's I might have worked on some radials that had um, at least keepers in the in the piston full floating so free to float in piston and Conrod. What kind do you have? All right. To I me, mean, this is the most common. Most common in aviation. <coughs> There's some pros and cons to that. No idea what the pro is. Uh, but there's definitely some, some drawbacks to this. So if we had a uh, stationary or even semi-floating, I guess, but we used keepers. Yours has a 
DW does, yeah. Like this one has got keepers inside the piston. And so this rod, or p the piston pin, it has no movement lateral, none whatsoever. And it also floats inside of the piston, and it floats on the con rod too, right? So it's fl full floating in a way, but yet it has keepers to lock it in. We don't do that. Your engine is not unique to aviation. What you have is pretty, that's the way it is. Uh, they're full floating. So you have to have something that rubs against the wall of the cylinder. And that something is the piston pin plug. And there are nothing but problems happen with piston pin plugs. Let me see, do I get into that? Um, yeah, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, let me see. Some engines may use uh, piston pin retainers. Like I just showed you, that would, that would keep the piston pin keep piston pin from damaging cylinder wall. But we don't have those. Um, and the things you can use are what I just showed you, the circlets, which are kind of like snap rings. Snap rings. Um, which is snap rings that fit in a groove, fit in a groove. Um, but we use piston pin plugs. Um, you stretching or question? Oh, question. Okay. Uh, why wouldn't we use uh, circlets like I can't answer that question. I have no idea. All right. Um, oh, this is just fun to know. Piston pin fit is hard to measure. Did you guys figure that out? Yeah, it's exactly. Okay. It's very, very difficult to measure. I have found it's almost easier to know what I'm going to tell you and not measure, which is cheating, but I'd rather cheat a little bit and know than measure and not get the right answer. By the way, one of the tricks I use for using a T-gauge is always use something to guide you if you can. Like, for in other words, if I were going to measure this piston pin boss with a T-gauge, I would not go at it this way and measure it. I would go from this side all the way through, and that way when I see the T-handle sticking out this way, I could line it up right dead center of that window, and it really lines you up very, very well. And then pull it out that way, and then up this way, and out that way. Follow? Just a trick. All right, piston pin fit. So. Um, point zero zero one is about the smallest clearance you can assemble, you can assemble without a press or a temperature difference. So if you've got a heat one and cool one, that doesn't count. But if they're both at room temp, 001 is about the only, you know, you got to have at least that or you're starting to use a press. 001 will go in, and if it's oiled, it'll go back and forth. And by the way, you guys, be really, uh, maybe I should mention this one, be very, very careful about putting a piston pin in a piston dry. I've seen them gall up in place. So aluminum galls. You got to remember this. You're putting your engine together now. So absolutely anything that goes inside of aluminum, I mean, from once you start, and I mean everything, even like I said, a piston pin going in, in a piston, it'll gall and stick in there. And you'll have to beat it out and ruin the piston. It'll pull metal. It's crazy. You're like, I can't believe that happened. And when it happens to you, then you'll know. But it's, anyway, um, <clears throat> so every single thing, you have a, Oil pressure relief, you try and screw it into your crankcase, that's aluminum on aluminum. I, I tell you about the time I, I ruined one of these. The day the engine was supposed to leave the shop. I just didn't have enough oil on it, that's how I learned. Nobody told me, you gotta have something on it. I went, I just screwed it on a little tiny bit, got a couple three threads started, it was still showing, half of it was still sticking out. And it eek, stopped, I'm like, well that was weird, I was just using my hands, right? And so, so I'm like, well, 
just a little burr or something, you know, a piece of glass bead or something. So I put my wrench on it. It wouldn't tighten. Like, oh, that's not good at all. Well, I better take it out. So I went to take it out. It wouldn't come out at all. And so you, hand just from my hands. So that was the last time I put anything in aluminum without anti-seize or oil on it. Well, aluminum, aluminum, I use anti-seize. Um, so yeah, I had to force it out with a wrench about that long. And this was complete garbage. Throw that away. But now the case was damaged. So how do you fix a case? Send it off. Yeah, it's real simple. You disassemble the entire engine, you send the case off. So thankfully, I was able to call another shop that had a tap that size. I was able to clean the threads with the tap and salvage the case. And it was fine once I got the burrs out of it and order a new one. I had another one of these in stock. So save the day. But man, it was, it was close. <clears throat> That's common procedure. You're, you're allowed to fix threads, chase threads. That's, I'm, I'm not cutting new threads. Because you didn't oversize I'm it. Cleaning, I didn't oversize it. I'm just cleaning the threads that are there. You're allowed to do that. That's, that's like 4313. That's 4313, yeah. If nothing else, you got 4313 says you are allowed to do that. You're allowed to put in helicoils. So not a problem. All right, point zero zero two. Let's see. Um, we'll allow sliding. Um, but almost no, um, lateral play? yeah, radial play? not radial. I have perceivable, I had side play, which would be back and forth, but, but almost no side play. In other words, if you put a piston pin in there, risk it, I don't need oil on me. You wouldn't, if you put it in more, you wouldn't be able to go up and down with it. It would just, it would slide nicely, kind of, in fact, you can even like shoot it from one side to the other, kind of at 2,000. They go right through, back the other way. But when you pull it out like this and you try and move up and down, you have very little. And then 003 um, will have a perceivable side play. You can wiggle it up and down. Like, yeah, it's kind of loose. Um, all thickness. I just want to mention that Lycoming has several different wall thicknesses. I bring it up because they mention it, like thin wall versus thick wall. So Lycoming has thin and thick walls. Multiple combinations of piston pin, combinations of piston, pins, and plugs. And this is, this was a, a major problem for a while. There, they have heavy, heavy wall piston pins, and they have the thin wall. That becomes a bit of a problem if you're doing a repair out in the field and you have to change out a piston pin. Why is that a problem? You have to figure it out. Huh? You have to figure out which switch. Well, the real problem is, can you see how thick this thing is? Yeah, that's a big one. How much more does this weigh than the one you have in your side, in your engines? How much? Because you got thin wall. This thing's beefy. You get in a fight, that's the thing you want right there. Like a roll of quarters, man. It's like, uh -huh. so. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't think I have a thin wall in here. But you guys have the thin wall right there, so you know what a thin wall looks like. So this bad boy is huge. So you can't really mix and match them. So make sure you know what you got and don't. You know, if, some, if you have a thin one and somebody goes, oh, it's superseded to this, and you order it and you get that, and you're like, ha ah, no, that's too much weight difference. You'd have to change all of them out. So I have one Honestly, anymore, I'm going to say the 290 and the 235 use the lightweight and everything else went to heavyweight, the thick wall. All right, let's talk about piston pin plugs. 
piston pin plugs. You would think there would be very little to talk about it, but there is. Let me see, what do I have here? I'm sure, I must have pictures. Let's see. Well, I was right in line. Okay, so uh, Continental. These are Continentals. So Continental uses a combination of stuff. Like this one over here, that's a small, smaller Continentals. The 65s, 85s, 0200s, 0300s. And these plugs do come out. I've seen a lot of damage with these. Uh, if you have a Continental and you're getting high oil an analysis that shows a lot of aluminum or you get a lot of aluminum in your screen, the number one culprit is piston pin plugs. They're made out of aluminum and, and these, these pop out. In fact, one time we had a customer, the O300, and uh, making a lot of metal, uh, aluminum. And so, yeah, I was like, okay, it's probably piston pin plugs. I mean, it's a lot of aluminum. So we pulled the cylinder and you know those, uh, those chocolate Easter eggs you get? They're like Hershey Kisses, but they're, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, the, uh, no, they're, they're small. They're just chocolate. You just, they come in aluminum foil. You open it. Oh, cheapy ones? Like, no, cheapy ones, yeah. yeah. This looked exactly like that, a silver one. I mean, exactly. Same size, same shape, same everything. It's a little tiny football. I'm like, what the heck? How did this get in here? Where's the piston pin plug? That was all that was left. It turned into a little tiny football that tall. It's the damnedest thing. I don't know how it did that. But yeah, made a lot of aluminum. So these make a lot of aluminum. These things right here are bizarro. They're right here. So steel, again, aluminum plugs. That's a one piece plug. You don't get it out. It's one piece. One time I saw one break and I could pull it apart. And I wish I knew what happened to that one. I don't know if it was here or work. Or, huh? How do they get it in? They, they make it around the piston okay. pin. I think it's a one piece. Oh, because you can like, you can like cast, cast that, yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. it because uh, aluminum has a lower melting point than steel and they're just able to kind of put it in place? Yeah. If not, then, then it's pressed and the, each pin is about. Yeah. But I've never seen these come loose, ever. I saw one broken, but not out of an engine. Somebody just handed it to me. Oh, check Why it out. You can do that. that okay, I don't care. Well, that way you can see it. I know. I don't have time for that. You have time for that? We'll do that. Sure. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah, you're always here early. Just cut one up. Take one out of Larry's engine. But anyway, so these do not these do not come out. You order a piston pin, it looks like that. Um, but the other nice thing, when you order a piston pin from Continental, looks like that. Even the small ones. That's, boom. I need a piston pin. That's what you get from Continental. It's all, all good to go. Um, back in the old time, old, old timey days, you could order piston pin and plug separately for these little ones, but yeah, you don't do that more. So Continental, let me think. Oh, yeah, piston pin plugs. Um, Is there any galvanic corrosion between them because of the different materials? If it is, it's inside and nobody's ever complained about it. Nobody knows. So the two little bronze rings on that piston up there, been, is that just from the oil? Yeah, there's no bronze. It's solid steel. So let's see, large bore, large bore TCM, Continental. Um, use piston pins, oops, use piston pins. What is two rings on this thing? That's where it didn't that run in the, stuff. in. that's where the, it did not run in the Conrod or the piston. So that's how much space you have that doesn't ever wear. That's the coloration I was talking about. where you grab it when you shoot spit wads out of it. Yeah. All right, bore TCM used piston pins with non-removable plugs. Asterisks, because I'm sure if you tried hard enough, you could remove them. <laughs> uh, let me see, um, small bore TCM used piston pins with pressed in plugs. Similar to what you guys are working with on that 290, but you can pop yours out. Uh, one of these in good shape. They're kind of hard to get out. Uh, where am I here? Okay, Lycoming. Goodness gracious. Um, Lycoming has used several types of plugs. They have had their issues, and issues they have had. 
So if we go into our Wayback Machine, they had a plug like this, one on each side. It was aluminum and bronze. That was the old engines. So I had this aluminum and bronze plug, but they had a much better idea and they went to one I don't remember anymore, either this one here that's just all aluminum or the aluminum plug. I can't remember which one. Let me see, LW117. Had to be this one because of the part number. So had the aluminum bronze going way, way back. Then I think they, then they went to the 60828, which is the same thing, but just aluminum. And then these things started giving all kinds of fit. So they had to come up with a new idea. So they went over here to this LW11775 aluminum piston pin plug, which is piloted inside of the hole. And that gave them all kinds of problems. So they went back to the drawing board. You know what they came up with? One. Aluminum bronze piston pin. Oh, <laughs> it's something like that. I may have a little bit of the story wrong, but they, it's made this complete circle. Isn't this and the second time they've done that now? This is on different things, yeah. Um, with the, what was it, oil pump? Yeah. Yeah, when I first got in the field, uh, the oldest, you, you go, um, some of the old, old 470s, and you pull out a piston pin plug, it looks like that. Now you go to a brand new Continental and pull it out, it looks like that. <laughs> so, you know, they don't try new things very often at Continental, it seems like. Um, there is a service instruction because these weigh so much different. And this is where I got this from. Let me see. Remove from service. Replace both plugs and cylinder with the 72198. Go to the, so yeah. If you have this, remove it from service. Don't use these anymore. They're, they're problematic. So get rid of those. Go to the, this aluminum bronze one. Um, if you have just the aluminum, it's in individual cylinders. Replace both with the, that one in complete engines. Replace with the 72189. So if you were to take a cylinder off, and look at it, and you had just aluminum piston pin plugs, and you had to replace them, what do you replace it with? The same one. Just aluminum, because of the weight difference. But if you're going to replace them all, then you go with the aluminum, aluminum bronze. bronze. Um, you'll never remember this, but there's a real trick to getting these things in, which is just freaking hilarious. It's stupid once you know how easy it is, but it's, it's really hard to get the piston pin plugs in. They're kind of short, and you gotta line them up just right to get them in the hole. And it seems so difficult to get them in. And so what you do is you put the piston pin in first, and the piston pin slides back and forth. And then all you do is push the piston pin out a ways, I mean, that, that far. Put the plug on it, push the plug in, and it lines it up perfectly and just drops in the hole. Go to the other side, push it in. I wish I could demonstrate that to you. But just to take one of those plugs and try and get it in the hole perfect, I don't know, they don't go in. So, yeah. All right, so that, that's, uh, that's your piston pin plug talk for the day. Um, sometimes piston pins don't want to come out of their cylinders. You guys got lucky, every single one of you. All of your piston pins came just sliding right out. So nice, but it doesn't always work that way. Uh, where's that piston pin floating around here? So you have two lines on here where... It never touches anything, so what builds up on there, you can get a little bit of carbon build up or something like that, and it doesn't want to come out, or it just stuck in the piston, doesn't come out. So how do you get it out? Put heat on. Take a big drift and just whack, right? Yeah. And what does that do to your connecting rod? Yes. E e e e e. Right, so now your connecting rod's out of alignment because you can't go whacking on this because it bends this, right? So don't do that. Um, what I was doing here in our shop for your 290s is real easy. Um, I would just take a heat gun and just put a heat gun behind here for just a few minutes and pretty soon it just starts sliding right out. So that's one trick is to use a heat gun, just warm things up, makes it everything expand. And so that's one thing you should be thinking. Well, if everything expands, then wouldn't it be the same? I mean, this different materials. It is different materials, but what if it was all steel or all aluminum? Does heating it up make it expand and easier to disassemble? No. It does actually. That book I was talking about yesterday, the Sky Ranch Engineering Manual, there's a whole thing in there about, well, what it does, everything gets bigger. Let's say this was all the same material. This gets bigger, this gets bigger, the space between gets bigger. So. I, mean, plus I guess that's the heat up. Yeah, huh? They expand proportionally. Yeah, but now if you, had, if you had one material that heated up and expanded at a different rate than another, 
it works with this because the aluminum expands at a faster rate than the steel, so that's a good thing. But <coughs> say you had an aluminum piston pin plug. Anyway, this little tool here, we do have it in the shop. I've never actually had to use one. Um, there's always a way to coax it out gently. But this goes right on there and then screw that down and it pushes the uh, piston pin out the other end. But I prefer to coax it out gently rather than force it, but that's just me. All right, what are we going to talk about here? Piston pin plugs. I don't think I need to write all this. Bronze is the newest. Yeah, the 6028 was a previous design, but due to weight differences, not disposable. Pilot plug, no reuse. Okay. Good. We're good with that. What's the takeaway from piston pin plugs? They suck. If you get a lot of aluminum, number one the culprit is piston, piston pin plugs. <laughs> yeah. um, light combing. If you're going to change out piston pin plugs, make sure you read the service instruction. Use the right ones. <clears throat> yes. Time check. Time check, thanks. That goes by so fast. <laughs>